double feature uh, that uh, I'm presenting together with Sophie. Uh, so you notice she's uh, uh, part of this work as well. Um, and it's work that basically started when I was still in Paris um, and is currently worked out by a joint postdoc, David Barrett, who has the nice, uh, uh, who basically has the possibility to both hang out in Paris and in Lisbon, which is kind of nice. And it's about efficient coding and balanced networks unification. Now I noticed uh, that the actual talk has little to say about either noise or decision making. So I thought I'd put up something about why we're here and why we're talking about things. And I think the main message in terms of noise that we're going to present in our work is noise is basically, from our point of view, simply lack of experimental control. Okay, so if I put it uh, in, in Albert's work, that's really the main source of noise um, and any kind of intrinsic variability, any kind of intrinsic trial, trial variabilities that you see would essentially scale with something like one over n where it's the number of neurons, so you can basically neglect it. That's the take home message. Now then of course the question is, well, why should you believe us, right? I should put up, yeah, why should you believe us? And I think the reason why this framework is interesting is because we can explain a lot of data, okay? Which essentially is what makes a theory fail or not fail in the end. And the part of data that I'm going to talk about is mostly neural tuning in a variety of systems. So to come to the actual talk, and I outsource all the, all the explanation on the noise part basically to Sophie's talk, okay? And I'll talk about uh, something slightly different. So uh, there are two theoretical frameworks um, that we're going to unify with our work. One framework is the framework of efficient coding, which many of you may be familiar with, but maybe not everyone. And efficient coding is basically a, a framework that starts with functional objectives to explain neural tuning. The objective essentially is just something in a sensory system, for instance, to find a good representation for the natural, natural stimuli in an animal's environment. And it has been very successfully applied to a variety of sensory systems. There's very beautiful work by Bruno Olshausen and David Field from 96 and 97, for instance, where they use this framework to explain how you get the distribution of receptive fields in the primary visual cortex. Then later it was applied by Michael Lewicki, for instance, to the auditory cochlea. And again, he could show that if you assume that all the cochlea is trying to do is find an efficient representation for natural sounds, then you end up with something that looks a lot like the filters, the bandpass filters that you find in these neurons. Okay, so this framework is all about explaining neural tuning, in some sense, in sensory systems. Then there's a second theoretical framework that uh, was developed in the 90s, which is the framework of balanced networks, which is mostly mechanistic. And what it did is it tried to explain mechanistically how can you actually have this very strong irregularity that we find in many neural systems, especially in cortical systems. And so you could say it basically was designed to explain something like spike train statistics in networks. And it has led to, this, uh, to a bunch of very nice papers on the theory of balanced networks. And then later was also experimentally tested um, to show that indeed in many cortical neurons, at least the anesthetized state, you do find balance of excitation and inhibition uh, in vivo. And basically what we are here to tell you is that we think these two frameworks are really just two sides of the same coin, and that with some small modifications and reinterpretations, we can say it's essentially the same thing. And you may notice, okay, this is a Portuguese euro coin here. Um, and so you could say, oh, but that's shaky. But actually, I'm a, I'm a believer in the euro, um, and do think that, in fact, there is something to this unification. Of course, then you can say, well, so theorists unify some stuff that's like nice math, but maybe that's not of interest. But it has several interesting consequences. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. And one of the interesting consequences is that we predict that neural tuning will change instantaneously whenever you knock out part of a circuit. Okay? And I'll explain how that works. So how do you move from efficient coding to balanced networks? So let me briefly review how efficient coding works, and that's like the, the technical part of the, the talk, so we'll show you a couple of equations for five minutes. 
but then I'll try to uh, provide some intuitions afterwards. So efficient coding, you can see in a, in a, in a, in a toy model in the following way. There's some variables x that a neural population wants to represent, and it wants to represent it in the firing rate of these neurons here. Okay? And the way you represent it is that you basically take a linear readout. So you take weighted combinations, where the weights are wi, of the firing rate of the neurons to get back at what you actually wanted to represent. And in this part, I'm really basically going to just assume that x is something that the population already knows, and all it wants to do, it wants to represent it. And if you wonder, okay, that's kind of boring, a population that sort of knows about x and then is just trying to represent it, we can tell you later how you can also design networks that compute something rather than just representing. But here it's all about representing. Efficient coding is mostly about representation. So you assume there's this linear decoder that allows you to represent something by a linear combination of firing rates. And then you wonder, well, how should a network actually choose a firing rate? How should firing rates be distributed within a network? And in the efficient coding theory, basically there's an optimization criterion that you try to uh, optimize. So you choose the optimal firing rates. Where optimal firing rate is defined with respect to a particular optimization criterion, which in this case is very simple. It basically just says you want to minimize the error of your representation. So you want to have that x hat, which is your readout, is very close to the variables x that you want to represent. But you also want to minimize the cost of the representation. The cost can be either something like just a metabolic cost, <clears throat> where you say, oh, I want to find a representation where the firing rates are not too high. But it can also be something like a computational cost, okay? which we may come back to later. And then within the efficient coding hypothesis, you then do a second minimization, because one of the things you have to uh, be clear about is that this minimization will work for one particular x, and it will spit you out firing rates, a set of firing rates for one value of x. But if you use another value of x, you get another set of firing rates. So now what you can do is you can look at the average error if you average over all possible variables x that this network may ever see where p of x may be something like the distribution of the relevant stimuli that this network will experience. And then you can ask yourself, okay, this average error, how does it actually depend on these readout weights, w's, that are initially assumed? And you can ask, okay, what are actually the optimal readout weights that we should choose? So that's the standard efficient coding theory as used by Olsen and Field, for instance. And to make a step towards balanced networks, we're actually going to do something very simple. Instead of minimizing here with respect to the firing rates, we're just going to minimize with respect to the spikes. Okay? And that'll be so, uh, up to Sophie to explain how exactly that works and why it gives you a, a balanced network. <clears throat> but there's basically a reinterpretation of the uh, efficient uh, coding theory in the sense that we say finding this optimal firing rate is something that is done very fast and is done due to the dynamics of the system itself. Whereas finding these optimal weights is something that happens on a much slower time scale, either through learning or even through something like development. And if you do this minimization with respect to spikes, the one thing you basically have to assume is how do the spikes translate into firing rates, and we just assume that the firing rates are just simply filtered versions of the spike trains. So you take your spike train, you filter it into this type of firing rate, and <clears throat> With this basically link between a spike train and a firing rate, all you do then is greedy minimization with respect to the spikes, which gives you this balanced network of integrated fire neurons, as Sophie will explain. And once you have such a balanced network, you could in principle just simulate it, and you will see that it works very nicely. So here you have, for instance, the stimulus x that we're representing. This is the actual representation x hat, and you see that x hat nicely tracks x, and these are the spike trains of all the neurons in the, in the network. And then you can ask yourself, well, how do the firing rates depend on x in this framework? And you just plot the firing rates as a function of the variable x that you're representing. And you can either just do it all numerically, or you can go back to the efficient coding framework and just make a small change, which is almost trivial. And I like to joke that as theorists, we have to covered something very important, 
and that its firing rates are actually positive. Okay, because if you look back in the original literature, it has usually been ignored. But it has very interesting consequences if you assume that firing rates are positive. And so we're going to approximate this spiking solution by just saying let's use this optimal firing rate here under the constraint that the firing rate has to be positive. And if you want to solve that, that it actually has also been done numerically, but it gives some additional insights and the uh, algorithm you have to use is called quadratic programming. So now I'll explain you how these networks can explain tuning in a variety of systems. Now one of these systems that I like a lot is actually the Ocular Mode Integrator because it's one of the simplest systems that has something like persistent activity. It's a system that essentially stabilizes horizontal eye fixation. So you find it in, in many vertebrates and one of the interesting properties of the system is how preserved the distribution of tuning is when you go say from monkeys to cats to goldfish. And here you have you do some beautiful work of M. Raksai, the distribution of tuning curves in the goldfish. Here's firing rate, and this is the eye position. Zero is the, is the midline, the central eye position. And then you go to the left and to the right. These are the tuning curves of the neurons on one side of the ocular motor integrator, which is basically a small circuit in the hindbrain. And I think it's actually interesting if you look at these tuning curves. And by the way, I wish that more people were plotting something like distributions of tuning curves in whatever data they have, instead of looking at single neurons, because I think there's a lot of information in this distributional property uh, that you find in these tuning curves. If you look at these tuning curves, what you will notice is, well, they have different thresholds here. They're all threshold linear, although in all fairness, I should say they're threshold linear here because they're fits to the actual tuning curves, so we don't really know how threshold linear the actual tuning curves are. Um, and you basically see they have these different thresholds and they also have different slopes. And what generally happens is that the slope, the slope increases as you move towards the midline. And this typical distribution is actually preserved in all of these systems. The, ocular, the goldfish has only 40 neurons, the monkey has 1,000 neurons. Still, the distribution of tuning curves is more or less the same. So from a theoretician's perspective, I've always been wondering, okay, why this distribution of tuning curves? Why not some other distributions? If I was an engineer, I wouldn't build a system like this, okay? So I want to give you some insight of why I think now that actually can be explained. Another thing <coughs> which makes the ocular motor integrator interesting is that uh, M. Raksai also in David Tank's lab at that time basically did experiments where he would knock out part of the circuit. And one of the things you notice is if you knock out a single neuron on either side of the ocular motor integrator, it has very little effect on uh, the functioning of the circuit. On the other hand, if you knock out a whole side, one side of the integrator, so one half of the whole system, you will notice that half of the eye positions become unstable. And I want to say that we think we can explain these two results as well. So to explain how that works, we're going to start with a little toy model that only has two neurons. So it's a little toy integrator. And we're going to assume that the eye position x hat is being read out by a difference between the firing rates of the two neurons. And then we're going to look at this optimization here, which is in the end done through a network of spiking neurons. But now we'll just do it mathematically and we say, what are the firing rates that you should choose to optimally represent the eye position? And for simplicity, we're at the beginning, I'm just gonna set the cost to zero. And if you do that, then you have two firing rates that you have to choose to minimize the quadratic loss. And you'll notice that there are many, many possible solutions. Just to show you two of the solutions. One of the solutions, for instance, is shown here, where here is the I position, X. This is the firing rates of the two neurons. So you have these threshold linear functions, R2, R1. And if you now subtract R2 minus R1, then you'll notice that what you get is basically an identical uh, identity line, where here is the representation of I position X hat, or X estimate, and this is the actual I position. So you basically get a trivial identity. And that is one possible solution um, for this problem. There are, however, other solutions. To point out another solution, we could also, yeah? There's no variability. It's all deterministic at this point. Um, 
At this point, there is no reconstruction error, actually, right? At this point, there's no reconstruction error. Later, when I introduce the costs, there will be a little bit of reconstruction error because the system is also trying to minimize the cost, so then it's a trade-off. Um, I'm not, we can talk about that later if you're interested. So at this point, I don't have a noise model, basically. And I'm only interested in explaining neural tuning. And you can, for instance, say we only explain the average neural tuning, so the average out neural tuning. We don't try to explain also the variability uh, that you see. And maybe Sophie can talk a little bit more about the noise model, for instance. <clears throat> OK, another solution. For instance, is this solution, where basically you now have the firing rate of neuron R1 being just the same as it was before, but now the neuron R2 has a threshold that is shifted to the left, and neuron R1 now needs to adapt whenever neuron R2 starts moving up to basically compensate for the firing rate that R2 is now uh, adding to the readout. So that in the end, if you subtract R2 minus R1, you again have a perfect reconstruction of the I position. Okay. So that's another possible solution. And then you can imagine there are many solutions to this problem that you could all set up. So which solution to take? So to make the solution unique, what we're going to do is we're going to add a cost. And the cost in this case is basically motivated by the Oakland motor integrator. One of the things, for instance, we say is, well, it's not really the eye position you're representing. You're representing muscle tension. You probably don't want to have zero muscle tension whenever you're looking uh, central. You want to always have some average muscle tension. The way we get some average muscle tension is by basically saying, okay, we set up a target population firing rate. So instead of just representing X hat, we also want the population on average to have a, a certain amount of firing so that you don't have zero firing at the midline. And that is basically just given by Z minus Z hat here, where Z hat, in the simplest case, is just the addition of the firing rates of the two neurons. And then we add a little quadratic cost, which basically tries to push the solution towards lower firing rates if it's possible at all. And if you put up this cost, then this becomes the unique solution uh, to the problem. <coughs> and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move from 2 to 20 neurons. But for simplicity, we have identical neurons. So there are 10 neurons on one side, 10 neurons on the other side. They're exactly identical. And the readout weights are minus 1 or plus 1, just as before. But now I added this extra axis here, which is this cost factor that describes how much we also worry about getting this average population firing rate, so that there's some average amount of spikes for all possible eye positions. And it's 0 0.1 here because that's one-tenth of, uh, it's basically just an averaging, so it's one-tenth of 10. It's one-tenth if you have 10 neurons on one side. And now, the next thing I want to ask is, okay, so we have 10 identical neurons on each side. What happens if we introduce a little bit of heterogeneity, if we don't assume that all the readouts are exactly the same? if the readouts are slightly different on both sides. And if we do that, so we make the readout slightly different, so we have now 20 diverse neurons, and you notice, okay, the readouts are now slightly different on the two sides, then what you notice is that the tuning curves of these two sides will also diversify, and we can make the readout even more diverse, or even more diverse, and then we get very diverse tuning curves. However, it basically has almost no effect on the precision of the readout, okay? It's still a deterministic system. The little errors that we have here are simply because we're also trying to minimize the cost. But which of these solutions we take doesn't matter at all to the system, okay? Any kind of, any of these diverse solutions will give you a perfect representation of the I position. as the dots move towards, ah, okay, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, <clears throat> so for instance, look at this one, which is basically very dark red. So the readout rate here is almost zero, okay? If the readout rate is almost zero, then it doesn't really contribute a lot to the I position, but it can still do a lot for the cost factor. And to do that, what you will notice is this curve here, which is almost flat and just degenerates a little bit on the sides that is the one that corresponds to the readout weight that is very, very small. And what it basically does is it doesn't care about, about I position, it mostly cares about the cost factor that we introduced. Okay, the next thing we can do is we can ask, well, 
are all spikes equal in terms of this cost factor C? Or should we say that maybe some spikes are more important for the muscle tension in the end than others? And we can also diversify that. So I'm diversifying the cost. And what you then start noticing is, okay, you get even more diverse tuning curves, but still the eye position representation is basically not affected at all. Okay, you still have the same eye uh, position representation. So I have five more minutes. Okay. And so that is why we believe that you potentially have this very diverse representation of tuning curves in the ocular motor integrator because it just doesn't matter. So I guess from a biologi uh, point, biologist's point of view, that seems almost trivial as an outcome. But uh, for me, it was still a revelation to say, okay, you have variability because the system works with variability. It just doesn't matter whether you have a system that has variability or doesn't have variability in the tuning curves. It amounts to the same thing. So you're more likely to find a very variable system rather than one where everything is extremely homogeneously tuned. But now <clears throat> we can start playing around with the system. And one of the things we can do is we can ask, okay, how do the tuning curves change if we start ablating neurons? And again, in our theory, this would mean that the system adapts one postsynaptic potential uh, later. So the tuning curves are going to shift within 10 milliseconds if you take out one of these neurons. That would be the prediction. So if we take out this neuron here with readout weight zero, you'll basically see very little effect on the tuning curve. But then we can take out the next one, and you'll notice the tuning curves are slightly shifting. Take out more, and again, you see the tuning curves are shifting. And they're shifting because they're still trying to represent that eye position. You take out more, you take out more, and now, you basically, because this is just pure math at this point, you can more or less have an ocular motor integrator where you have only one neuron on, the, on one side and uh, all the other neurons on the other side. But that's because we don't really consider saturation or noise, by the way, for that matter, which would matter at this point, obviously, right? But as long as everything is deterministic, there's very little effect even if you just have one neuron on one side. But if you take out that last neuron, then what you're going to notice is that you can no longer represent the negative eye positions. And the explanation is almost trivial. It's because you don't have any negative readouts. And without negative readouts, well, you can't represent negative eye positions. And what are the neurons with a positive readout supposed to do when the goldfish is trying to look here to the left to the negative eye positions? Well, the best they can do is not fire at all. Because whenever they fire, they suggest a positive eye position. Okay? So this would be our explanation of why the system basically doesn't work for half of the eye positions anymore. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things is that if you look, so I don't, we don't yet have the data from MRXI, but we're going to get it to check this in more detail. But like the one neuron they're showing in their paper actually does look a little bit in terms of its tuning, like one of these tuning curves here. But then we can move it up and move to other systems. One system we moved it up to is the cricket circle system. And if you wonder why the cricket circle system, well, because it's a textbook system. It's basically in the Diane and Abbott, so that's why we know about it. Um, it's a system that stores wind velocity, and it has four interneurons that represent wind velocity, um, <clears throat> wind velocity in the horizontal plane, and what's shown here is the firing of these neurons with respect to the wind dire uh, direction of the uh, wind uh, that the cricket basically is experiencing. And we can basically say, okay, it's really just a two-dimensional system, and all we need to hook up is we put up two neurons with two readouts. Okay, so there's the readout X hat and Y hat, and there are two readout weights for each neuron, so we have these four dots here, and then we maximize or minimize actually exactly the same function that we minimized before, and we plot it as tuning curves, and you find the same tuning curves you find more or less in the cricket, and you can again knock out one of the neurons, and if you knock out one of the neurons, then in this case, there's no effect on the tuning. And why is there no effect on the tuning here? Well, because the neurons are not carrying the same information. They're carrying different uh, types of information. They have these orthogonal uh, representations here, okay? These axes are all orthogonal to each other. So in this case, the tuning doesn't shift. So the tuning only shifts if neurons carry similar types of information. And then there's a paper that Sophie actually found um, where they did knock out one of these neurons and um, it turns out the tuning doesn't change. In their paper, it was mostly about whether the neurons are connected, and they say they're not connected. 
but that's also what we pr would predict. They're not connected because they don't share information. And we can scale it up and do the same thing that uh, Bruno Olshausen and David Field did, which is scan through these image patches here <clears throat> and assume that there are multiple linear readouts assume again the same encoding function. The only difference to uh, Bruno Olshausen and David Field's work is that we assume positive firing rates, okay? That's really the only difference. And we find the optimal uh, readout weights and we plot the optimal readout weights. And uh, one thing I forgot to say is the cost function that you have to set up in this case is basically a sparsity cost. Um, and then you find these types of filters that look similar to what you find in V1. The only difference that we now have because we assume positive firing rates is that you find polarity of tuning. So for every neuron in one direction, there's one that shows in the other direction. And we can also play games like this. For instance, what happens if you knock out one orientation columns in V1? Okay, if you knock out one orientation column, imagine this is orientation, this is the firing rates of the neurons, and imagine what happens if you ablate a couple of these neurons. So if you ablate a couple of these orientations, and then observe what happens to the orientations, to the nearby uh, uh, tuning of the neurons with the nearby orientations. And what you will see is that what happens is that to compensate for the loss of these neurons and still be able to minimize the reconstruction errors, the tuning curves here are going to shift inwards. The firing rate is going to increase and the, and the uh, preferred tuning of these neurons is going to shift inwards towards uh, the missing neurons. And, um, at this point, I don't want to make too much out of it because I would say it's still a preliminary, this part, but uh, there are experiments by Crook and Eisel where they actually did knock out orientation columns. One minute. Um, and they basically see a similar effect. But they also did a lot more complicated experiments which we haven't even tried to uh, simulate yet, so we'll have to see whether it holds up for all of these cases. We just simulated the case where you knock out one orientation column. So to conclude, our claim is that efficient coding balance networks, same thing. It amounts to finding the optimal spike trains on the population level for a given a fixed linear decoder. For spikes, the solution will be an integrated fire network, as Sophie is going to explain. For rates, the solution is basically quadratic programming. The consequences in terms of tuning of neurons is that you have actually complex and nonlinear shapes of the tuning curves. And the reason you have these nonlinear shapes is really just a positivity constraint. Because without that, the solution would most likely just be linear, depending on the costs, obviously. Then I'll also show you that basically the, these, these networks have an intrinsic robustness in the sense that they will instantaneously compensate the loss of any kind of neuron. And the tuning curves will actually change immediately. They will change 10 milliseconds after you killed a neuron. We would expect that the tuning of all the other neurons has changed. And, but the most important thing from my point of view is that we basically set up two very simple assumptions, which is linear decoding and a nonlinear encoding with spikes, which then can explain a lot of data over a variety of systems. Thanks. So I think one a very strong point that our theory makes is really this instantaneous uh, so that's change, amazing. right? We don't expect that this change would go through plasticity. We would expect the changes there as soon as you knock down those neurons. But otherwise you're right, like in just in terms of inhibitory dynamics and so on, you'll find similar kind of predictions with other type of frameworks or even just with uh, standard uh, natural inhibition models. But really the, the important thing is that we say it's going to happen instantaneously.